exactly uh, the important uh, message of uh, Alton Watson. Uh, here tonight is a candidate forum with the RLC. Why? Young Republicans. Okay, Just left. Um, and finally, that does bring me a little quick note on Alton Watson who's running for District 8. He is gone. Well, if you look at the odds, if you're actually running at the court hangar, we've seen some put out about 2,500 in the last few weeks. So, yes, yeah, I'm asking you to get one of the whole podcast campaign. So I can get more door hangers and walk around. Please do that. I appreciate it. And with that, John Burns, American for Prosperity, that will be talking to us tonight. He is the director of the coalition for North Carolina. And uh, he's going to talk about. Uh, Initiatives coming up in uh, 2018, and uh, we've got a lesson learned for 2017. So, John? Thanks. Um, so, my name is John Burns. Uh, I'm with American Prosperity. Uh, full disclosure, I came to American Prosperity by way of Concerned Veterans of America, which is a veterans organization here. So to, to set it up a little bit, um, how many people here are familiar with the John Locke Foundation and John Hood? So I was having a conversation with, with Donald Bryson, the AFP state director, John Hood, um, and some other leaders in the center right lane um, late in 2015. And John said something along the lines that going into the 2016 election cycle with, you know, with the threat to Governor McCrory, um, with the threat to the supermajority, with the possible threat to Senator Burr, with the presidential election, that, that we, you know, as nonprofits in the center right lane, had done a pretty bad job, hitherto, in describing the successes that our philosophy of government, that the small government philosophy, had achieved um, thus far in, in, in late 2015. And, and I was thinking about that yesterday, and I was thinking about a line that I read about five or six months later, just before the Republican convention last year. And I, I can't remember, it was in National Review, I can't remember if it was a Kevin Williamson or if it was Rich Lowry, but it was somebody along that line who, who wrote something very similar. He said, you know, that, that the intellectual leaders of the conservative movement had tried to shove a libertarian economic philosophy down the throats of the average American conservative voter and that they had rejected it. Um, and I think they were onto something in that, that the, the folks who write for National Review have focused on that economic freedom message, that economic liberty message in a lot of ways when they talk about economics. Um, but I don't think they had forced it down anybody's throat. I just don't think that they failed. I think that they have failed. They haven't succeeded in connecting the positives of that message, the, re the realistic positives of that message with the voters and the conservative base. Um, a couple of years ago, Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Prosperity Foundation started a project called It's Working, and it revolved around some of the successes that Governor Scott Walker had in Wisconsin, and it was an effort to try and combat some of the propaganda that the left was putting out about what Governor Walker was doing in Wisconsin. And Americans for Prosperity and National Office wanted to do something very similar uh, in North Carolina, so we came up with NC Real Solutions. And the idea is this is a project, it's an ongoing project, go through some of the things that are in it, about some of the things that are going right in North Carolina over the last half a dozen years or so. So let me flip the slide forward here. So we're going to talk about the Carolina comeback, right? So I moved to North Carolina um, just about at the beginning of some of the statistics we're going to look at in 2009. Uh, I did a tour in Afghanistan in 2008. My wife, who was born in Illinois and was living in Queens County, New York, along with myself at the time, um, made 
any future that we had together contingent on getting the heck out of New York City, um, which for uh, an idea for which I have much more sympathy now than I did eight years ago. Um, but she, yeah, she said, let's get the heck out of here. Um, so we did a lot of haggling in the course of the 10 months that I spent in Afghanistan. You know, she wanted to move really far south. I didn't want to move out of New York at all. So we kind of split the difference and we ended up in Raleigh. Um, now I live in Wilmington, but we moved to North Carolina, to Raleigh, North Carolina in the beginning of 2009, right at the height of the Great Recession, right? So, you know, this was a state that, that looked good on paper at the time, if you were thinking about moving here from Afghanistan, um, and it probably was better than Afghanistan. But it, what was the, the, the gravity of the economic problems here in North Carolina in 2009, end of 2008, were not reflected in the reporting that was going on that I was seeing from Afghanistan. So, as most of you know, in 2010 in North Carolina, um, the Democratic lock on the governance here was slowly started. It was slowly eroded. Right, it began in 2010, really, when we started to win majorities. Um, and if you look at the personal income tax rate um, from 2013 to 2017, you'll see that advocates for small governance, advocates for tax reform have succeeded in pushing it down from a three-tier system that topped out at 7.75% over the course of four years down to 5.25% um, going into 2019. So, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the tax cut we've got coming this year as we go forward. But over the course of the last couple of years, we pushed the personal income tax rate down successfully. And this is, you know, this is when I say we, this is the greater center right movement, libertarians, conservatives, particularly small government conservatives, groups like Libertarian Party, Americans for Prosperity working on the activist arm, Americans for Prosperity Foundation working on the education arm, getting out, talking to folks, talking to folks, holding our elected officials accountable. So similar trajectory on the corporate income tax rate, right? Uh, before 2013, um, after Governor McCrory was sworn in, we had 6.9% for a corporate income tax rate, down to 6%, 5%, 4%. And in 2019, we're going to be looking at a 2.5% corporate income tax rate. So that's, that's for economics. I mean, if you're deciding where to put your company, like me, Queens, New York, or Raleigh, North Carolina, if you're a corporation, Raleigh, North Carolina looks a lot better on paper than Queens, New York, or a high-tax locale. So the results of, of those tax policies. So our unemployment rate, I mean, just went <laughs> down from its height. Um, and, and we're not talking about the height of the Great Recession, right? So this chart starts in January of 2014. So fully a year after Governor McCrory was in, five years after, or four years after, the, uh, the North Carolina General Assembly was fully Republican um, and fully conservative. But our, if you, it tracks with the tax rates, right? So if you look, we were over 6.5% with 300,000 unemployed uh, back in January of 2014. And we're now just at about the national average. This is from uh, May. Uh, it's just below the 4.5 mark. Uh, we're tracking with the national average, which as of this month is 4.3. I think North Carolina is exactly there with the national average. So as those tax rates went down, our unemployment rate went down, right? So same thing, right? You can see corporate tax 6.9 down to 2.5, and pretty much at the same time, unemployment went down. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting because a lot of leftists, liberals, and who have yous just can't do the math, right? I mean, this is really simple stuff. Um, you lower personal income tax rates, you lower corporate income tax rates, and you get job creation. It's so simple, it's not, not even funny. So in the same time, North Carolina's ranking in the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council's rankings, uh, which is managed, you know, the, the, the rankings are designed by Art Laffer, uh, Reagan's economist. Um, so our, our rich state ranking, poor state ranking, we went from 22nd, right about middle of the road, right? Not the richest state, not the poorest state, but right there in that middle tier to number three one of the top three states, 
in terms of economic wealth and power. At the same time, um, the um, ranking for state business index moved from 44 to 11 out of 50. Uh, I don't know who those three economists are, but you know, obviously we're talking about over four years, we went from the bottom of economic ranking to the top of the economic ranking ladder. So I just wanted to touch base on the last General Assembly session because that was kind of what we were originally thinking about talking about and maybe looking at 2018. But just this year, the General Assembly session that we had with folks like Americans for Prosperity, folks like you guys, activists from all over the states, holding our elected officials accountable, we had a $3.6 billion tax cut, which is phenomenal. We capped spending at 3%. Um, and it was our goal at Americans for Prosperity um, to enact a rain style spending cap. So that, that basically is um, population growth plus economic growth um, should be the limit of your spending growth, right? You shouldn't grow your government spending any more than your economy grows essentially. So the, the rain's growth, the economic growth plus the population growth was 3.8%. So we've actually capped spending below that legislatively. Um, <clears throat> So we created an ESA, Education Savings Account, in North Carolina, legislatively. Uh, the first time we've done that legislatively in the state, so ESAs are now legal in the state. Uh, opportunity scholarships, uh, we increased the amount of opportunities available for opportunity scholarships to four, $45 million, um, which now means that 10,000 lower income students are eligible for those opportunity scholarships. So that puts more choice into education. It's education reform, and again, it's it's, giving the, the folks who need it a realistic way out of poverty. It's a path to economic prosperity that doesn't involve the government running everything or a big government in charge. And then lastly, um, this, this session uh, in light of Hurricane Matthew, we created a rainy day fund that right now is uh, 1.8 billion. So that's a savings that requires um, special legislative authority to release. The governor can't release it. It's a savings account. It's not part of the budget. So if we get a Hurricane Matthew or another Hurricane Matthew or Hurricane Harvey, we've got almost $2 billion in savings. And that's going to get added to, unless there's a crisis, whether it's an economic crisis or a, a natural disaster crisis. Um, that, that, by the way, um, is money that um, Governor Cooper didn't want to give back to the taxpayers in terms of the tax cut and money that Governor Cooper would rather spend today uh, than put in the rainy day fund. Uh, he tried to override, mo he tried to veto most of these, he was overridden. The only thing that he objected to but signed anyway was the rainy day fund. So just this year, we've seen more good government bills pass the North Carolina General Assembly. And again, that's gonna add to kind of the successes of North Carolina as, a, as an economic um, epicenter, a place where people wanna come, where we're gonna have job creation, and where we're gonna have economic growth. Uh, and we really need to get the word out to people because again, um, People don't know that, that these solutions are working and making their lives better. Um, just another bit, Triangle Business Journal has North Carolina as the best state for starting a business, and that was uh, just July this year. Um, Charlotte's fastest growing job, fourth fastest job growth in the state. Now here, North Carolina, um, our fellow citizens, not really tracking um, what's happening here. So Civitas, how many people are familiar with Civitas? Also a, kind of a partner organization, right? Um, Americans for Prosperity um, takes a lot of our uh, policy and certainly our polling information um, from conversations with Civitas. Um, they did a poll, they did a couple of polls. This one's from September last year. Um, as of September last year, um, of North Carolina likely voters, 41% believe that over the last several years, their state income taxes had gone up. Now you guys just saw the curve of how much they've gone down. Um, so John Hood was right. We're not getting the word out to the average person in North Carolina that, that these policies are being implemented and that they're working. Uh, 14, only 14% of likely voters believe they decreased. 35% believe they stayed the same. So 76% believe that they hadn't gotten the tax cut um, you know, and only 25% believe 
um, 24, 25% had any um, idea that they did. Only 14% actually believed that they decreased. Same thing with state taxes overall, not just state income taxes, but you get similar results. 49% of people uh, polled last year believed that their state taxes overall, including property taxes and sales taxes, had gone up. This is from May of this year after Governor Cooper had been sworn in. Um, this is not likely voters, it's registered voters. And 50%, 52% of voters believe that we're on the wrong track. Only 33% of voters believe we're on the right track. So again, this is a, a case of the information of what's been going on in the last four to six years is just not being properly introduced to the general public, right? They think that their taxes are going up. They don't think that the state's going in the right direction. At the same time, we have fantastic economic growth. You know, cities like Raleigh and Charlotte are being voted some of the best cities to do business in, the best cities to open businesses in, the, the, the most wealthiest state or, or one of the most wealthiest economically positive states in the country. And yet most of the people who live here, 52% of them think we're going in the wrong direction. Interestingly, 49% of Republican voters believe the same thing. So we're not even reaching the, the conservative libertarian voters with this information successfully, right? Sir. So this is the actual the, the question that was asked on the phone. Now, this was asked after the tax questions, but it was, do you feel things in North Carolina are generally headed in the right direction or have things gotten off on the wrong track? So, so this, in, yeah, I mean, this, is, this includes economics. It includes, you know, at the time that these questions were being asked, obviously thoughts about House Bill 2, you know, you know last year, it was before Hurricane Matthew, but just before it, and we'd had a hurricane a year before, we had Governor McCrory. Um, you know, lots of discussions about politics, um, but this is from May of this year, and 49% of registered Republicans actually believe that the, the state's going in the wrong direction overall. So that brings me to NC Real Solutions, which is more than just me coming and talking to you folks. Uh, NC Real Solutions is, as it says, it's an effort to educate North Carolina citizens on the success of recently passed state budget education and regulatory reforms. Again, you know, talking to folks like John Hood of the John Locke Foundation, Francis DeLuca at Civitas, Donald Bryson, my boss, um, looking at the polling data, you know, we realized even before we had some of the, some of the polling data that, that I showed you, we realized that we were not getting the word out that that we knew as kind of subject matter experts and folks with our head in the game that all of these policies were being passed. But if you read the mainstream media here in North Carolina, if you open up the News and Disturber or, you know, the Charlotte Disturber or, you know, the Fayetteville Disturber or the Star News down in, in, in Wilmington, you're not going to hear about the positive economic changes that are happening in the state. All you're going to hear is, you know, doom, you know, Governor Cooper should win his lawsuit and, you know, and thank God House Bill 2 is gone. And you're going to hear stuff like that, but you're not going to hear about the positive economic benefits that low taxes and lower regulation have brought to our state in just a short period of time. You know, going back six years on some of these, no more than four years on other items, we've really made a big difference with the way our General Assembly and the last governor drove things, the way our General Assembly has overridden the current governor. So the state's in the right, going in the right direction economically with the right kind of policies, lower taxes, smaller government, less regulations. And yet, if we're not out there talking about it, folks like you aren't going to hear about it. And clearly, 49% of even registered Republicans aren't going to hear about it and believe that we're going in the right direction. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. So NC Real Solutions right now is based around a, a web page, basically. Um, and the web page has three ebooks available on it right now. I'm going to encourage folks to not only take the time when you go home um, and take a look at the page and maybe download one of these books, but please, you know, take a take a look at one of them, share it with your friends, let them know um, that this is out there because this is really a good way to start making a difference for 2018, right? If folks understand 
that the policies that the state has been putting in place over the last four to six years have been economically beneficial and, a, and push things in a positive direction, then it's going to affect the way they make decisions in 2018. Whereas if they continue to only get their news from the mainstream media here in the state, from, you know, from WUNC and, and the News and Observer, then they're going to believe that things are going in a bad direction um, and they're going to make some bad decisions. So we're, we're urging that you folks take a look at these. We have a page on tax reform. We have a page or an ebook on tax reform, a page or an ebook on education reform right now, things like the ESAs, the uh, educational savings accounts, and what we've done with opportunity scholarships and kind of the positive impact that those are going to have, and then one on regulatory reform. And, you know, this year regulatory reform was not the huge success that we hoped it would be. We got a few things across the, the finish line. Um, but obviously with things like the distiller bill and the, the brewery bill, which I see some fans of around the room, we, di we didn't get it as far as we wanted. Um, you know, we've had internally in Americans for Prosperity a lot of discussions, um, you know, um, uh, frankly in the state chapter, I'll be honest, I'm the oldest one in the state chapter uh, and I'm a beer drinker. Um, so amongst all of us, um, there's all beer drinkers and we, we love the idea of craft freedom. We like the idea of distillery freedom. We do have a little bit of fear of becoming known as like the alcohol guys. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't want to be alcoholics for prosperity. So, um, so we have a lot of discussions about how far to take that. Um, but as we look at our legislative agenda for 2018, um, you know, a, a better distillery, pro distillery bill and a better uh, craft freedom bill are definitely things that we want to achieve. We're going to be meeting with uh, some Charlotte area General Assembly members in October at uh, Doc Porter's in, uh, in Charlotte, Doc Porter's Distillery, probably taking them over to Great Wagon as well so that they can see like how those things work and maybe we can get some more folks from, you know, both sides of the aisle on board with distillery and uh, free and craft brewing freedom reform legislation for 2018. So, but folks, if that's something that you guys are interested in, and I, like I said, I've seen some of you at the events, I see some of the t-shirts about the room, it's something we're definitely we're working on, um, and we're looking for, for help and input with those. Um, we're going to be a little more proactive. We got on, kind of got on board that bandwagon late, because we did have this corporate merger, and, and like, you know, the, the coalition's director didn't figure out what he was doing until March, and so. <laughs> um, so we will be looking for help with things like that kind of regulatory reform. And then, just for everybody's information, um, that's what the kind of the splash page looks like. So I highlighted the, uh, the URL for anyone who's interested in going there. Um, it's about real policies that impact you and your fellow North Carolinians. Um, you see those radio buttons down there, regulatory reform, tax reform, education reform. Those are actually eBooks. Um, we're really encouraging folks to read them. They're not super long. They're not super involved but it, it really does talk about the kind of the successes um, that we've had. And these are the kind of successes, at least on the economic side, where I think Americans for Prosperity and most Libertarian Party members line up. Lower taxes, less regulation, smaller government, less government involved in education, more choice in education. So lastly, I'll take some questions, but I just want to, I, I didn't bring any business cards tonight, um, so I want to put my contact information up there for anybody who wants to get in touch with me about any of this later. And I'll take some questions. And I've been told that uh, you guys probably won't be heard on there. So let me give you the mic. <laughs> so um, at the beginning of your, uh, your presentation, you talked about how you know, uh, North Carolinians didn't think that they were at the lower taxes and stuff like that. I know that my taxes didn't go down. Who got those tax cuts? And should that be in, in closing that your poll bear? So, so, did your, so your tax rate has gone down. So your income tax rate has actually gone down. Perhaps, but the income ta tax rate has definitely gone down. Sales tax rates have gone up. Um, it doesn't. Some of that comes to the county. Some of that comes to the state to offset the revenue. But overall, your income taxes have gone down. And Americans for Prosperity, while we want lower taxes overall, we definitely believe it should start with income taxes because at least that gives you the decision where to spend your money, how long to hang on to it before you, you make a spending decision. Um, overall, though, state taxes have gone down overall. So we are still taxing less than... So you're just looking at the, the, like the average. You're not looking at individual... No, because... It went down to like, you know, the, because, because, right. 
but overall, overall, for most North Carolinians, the tax rates have across the board decreased. Corporate, well, it always is. Corporate taxes have decreased, and on top of that, like like the at the same time on the income tax side, the um, the standard deduction is going up every year, and in fact, it's going up to twenty thousand dollars next year. So that's another twenty five hundred dollars that you're going to get before taxation next year. So it's going down again, and with a 5.25% tax rate, that's the, the lowest we've had in, in a long time for income tax, so that's gonna go down again. Um, we're working and we'll be working next year to try and cap that so it never rises above 5.5% in the future. Sir? I was gonna say, um, we started out, it almost lost me at the beginning because we talked about Republicans running on libertarian principles, no good respect. Conservatives aren't libertarians. I agree. And the people weren't rejecting libertarian ideas, they were rejecting Republican conservative ideas. But having said that, and I think I think Frank and John know the difference between libertarian. And so so yeah, maybe I didn't the income tax thing is a tremendous step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I didn't make that clear. So so my my point was that um that there were people who were diagnosing a disconnect. And we haven't gotten the message to a lot of the rank and file voters, whether they were conservative, Republican, however they self-identify. On our side of the aisle, on our big side of the aisle, the anti-Democrat, anti-government, anti-spending side of the aisle, we haven't gotten the message out to rank and file voters throughout the country, or even here in North Carolina, that lower taxes, smaller government, and less regulation is good for them. So, so. Republicans have but at the same time, they have not reduced the size of the government, they've increased it, they've created new departments, they essentially raised taxes, but Amy's talking about is you reduce the income tax, it doesn't affect you all because I'm retired, no I don't pay income tax, but, but you're also increasing the sales tax and burdening it to more people, which affects a lot more people. So, that's why you get those fifty-two percent negative ratings. Okay. Overall, people are feeling the people who are less able to pay taxes are feeling. Well, that's excellent but feedback, but and I, I will. Social issues that we've talked about. Have so again, I'm not. I'm not. So I'm not here to talk about to, to advocate for the Republican Party. I'm here to say that I think some of the decisions that the General Assembly have made over the last four years have done. North Carolina has some good in terms of economic growth. So, 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 and I will take the feedback about the sales tax affecting the way people think about it because I think that's a valuable insight. And I don't think that Civitas, uh, when they did the poll, or some of our policy folks when they looked at this, took it into consideration. So we will work that into our presentation in the future, sir. So, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Republican who likes to uh, fancy to show up at libertarian meetings, but. I will say that how much of this do you think is actually a lack of information getting out there? And how much of this is, there were a lot of Republicans back before they had the majority who campaigned on the idea of eliminating income taxes entirely in the state. And a lot of that has not happened. And so when you see quarter percent reductions, no one notices a quarter percent reduction. And a lot of folks feel like, I, I, I'm wondering how much do you think of this? How much do you think of this as lack of information? How much of this is people who are kind of upset about the concept that it's not noticeable, it's not this big drastic change in tax rate where they expected the income tax to get eliminated in this state, and it never happens. So totally speculating, I'd say it's, there's probably a combination of that, a combination of people who live in some places have seen their sales tax go up uh, significantly. Um, it's certainly, the sales tax got spread to some services as well. Um, well, there's also new taxes on certain, there's new fees, there's new taxes on certain services, taxes on services were added. So, so I'm not here to say that the General Assembly has been doing things perfectly or doing everything right. What I'm here to say is, is that I think we, we're... And I'm not getting into the yeah. on that. I was more asking how much of that do you think is the result? So, so I think that there's a combination of factors, but I think that um, there is an education piece missing. I think that a lot of folks in this state are hearing what they hear about government spending, government growth, and whether the state's economy is doing well or poorly, strictly from liberal mainstream media outlets like the News and Observer, like you know NPR, WUNC, uh, and they're they're seeing it through that lens, and they're not hearing that the, the personal income tax rate reduction, the, the corporate income tax rate reduction, while maybe they haven't you know affected everyone equally and and given everybody the same economic advantage um, that they that they've given other people, 
overall, they've created a much healthier economic environment in the state with economic growth and far, far more employment than we had four or five years ago. So, sir. I don't know if it... Yeah, go ahead. I'll repeat the question. I would agree with you that there is a positive economic story to be told. I'm not trying to dice it out. It is not an exciting story to most people. What I hear when I hear economic news on the media is snore. You know, oh, the stock market rose a couple points. I don't have necessarily enough interest in that or, or, or all the statistics that you have raised, they can't be presented because they're already presented as the most boring things on the news. Do you have a program in, in your organization to try to make it more uh, in, in, in interesting? So the question is, can we make economic news more interesting? Uh, if we had a program to do that, we probably would be a for-profit organization, not a non-profit organization. <laughs> so, um, but does that seem to be a major problem for you? So, 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 so I think you're, you're always up against that, right? It's very easy to give a negative economic snippet and there's a confirmation bias that a lot of people have. And this is, this is just me spitballing. So don't take this as AFP policy or anything or AFP foundation policy. But I think most people have a negative confirmation bias. When they hear bad news, it sticks. When they hear good news, they're a little more skeptical of it, right? So when you start to add the accumulation of negative news stories, about the economy over time, uh, especially from you know elements in the media where, where a lot of people get their their news, um, it's harder to reinforce the economic positive. And then when there is an in-depth story, um, it's much harder to get people to pay attention. You know, it, negative messaging is easy, um, simple messaging is easy, positive messaging is harder, complicated messaging is harder. So simple and negative is the easiest thing to do. Positive and complicated is the most difficult message to get across to people in a lot of ways. Theft? <laughs> so, no, yeah, no, absolutely. And so, you know, we, Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Prosperity Foundation takes a great deal of our philosophy from the Charles Koch Institute and then from state policy network groups like uh, the Locke Foundation and Civitas and, you know, and the Mercatus Center at a national level, American Enterprise, uh, R Street. Uh, and that's a pretty common refrain that we hear when we get together. You know, we, we do want to remind everyone that overall taxation is theft and, and you've got to limit the things that you spend it on. And, and again, I'm not I, I'm not out here saying that the, the General Assembly or the, the last governor has done everything right. Um, but but things are going in a much better direction than they were when the simple attitude was more taxes, higher taxes on everything and more government for everything. Yeah, and it's not all of it's good. <laughs> um, so, they don't want to uh, have ABC report. They don't want to. It, it's plainly so. And there's a reason Budweiser and Coors are in other locations or they're not here. Uh, be, uh, because they start that. But we will never have our own competitors, Budweiser or Coors. We don't let our own uh, manufacturers build these large businesses. They specifically chose to hamper North Carolina businesses for the sake of old-fashioned North Carolina politics. Do you disagree? Do you nuance? I can nuance that a little bit. So um, I would say that, that um, on both sides of the aisle, and certainly on the Republican side, leadership in the General Assembly um, allow themselves to be influenced by a combination of um, campaign contributions and, you know, and a very, very high priced lobbying firm who spoke for the distributors um, and the distributors, uh, a group of 10 or 12 families that own 25 or 30 businesses throughout the state uh, were very against the growth of craft brewing self-distribution. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar, but for those of you who aren't right now, after 25,000 barrels of beer of production in the state, doesn't matter where you're distributing it. Once you hit 25,000, you've got to turn over all distribution and marketing rights to your distributors. So, in, in that legal news, North Carolina business, 
so we, so so we will. So um, the the nuance the nuance to it is is even the craft brewers don't want to lose the distributors from the system. They want to keep the three tiered system. They just want to take some of the economic influence and power out of the hands of the distributors. And the reason for that is is the the the, the craft freedom brewers and all the craft brewers in the state do not want to lose the distributors because if they lose the distributors, then then Budweiser, Heineken, Molson Coors, the three big brewers in the world, will just self-distribute in the state. And, and essentially, there'll be nobody defending the shelf space on the supermarket shelves for the craft brewers in North Carolina. So it, it's a really, I mean, the, the, the way that the economics of beer distribution is done is a mess. Uh, we will be in the fight next year for that. Uh, we would like to see a 200,000 barrel cap. Um, I think like, like some of the brewers would be willing to settle lower, but we, we were going to advocate for a 200,000 uh, barrel cap um, again next year. I, you know, I talked to, to some of the folks who talked to some of the folks at craft freedom freedom uh, just recently. And they're, um, you know, they're going to continue the fight. They've got a lawsuit based on some constitutional issues about how businesses can be regulated in this state. They think they might win there. I'm not going to speculate on their odds there. Um, but I think we're going to be looking at another, you know, another craft freedom issue laden year in 2018 in the General Assembly, and hopefully we'll get uh, some incremental victories. So, did you have a question over here? For That's up to you guys. <laughs> Probably. But, well, so, so, you know, all right, putting on my political consultant hat, if I was telling a libertarian conservative how to message that, I would, I would say something along the lines of, as a libertarian candidate, you need to say that when the Republicans act most like libertarians, we get the most economic success. And if you want more economic success, we need more libertarians. I'm gonna take off my political consulting hat. No, 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 I'm saying if I was, if I was, so if I was gonna be a campaign consultant, which I've done to a libertarian candidate, I would tell him to tell his, his electorate that look, there are some positive economic benefits from Republicans who've acted occasionally like libertarians. If you want more of these types of economic benefits, you need more folks like me. Because he's not what you could say. He's if he acts more like me, which he's not going to do, he's going to hit a line. You're only going to get X number of benefits. Whereas if you elect somebody who's even more small government, and this is just my political consulting thing, um, my strategy would be to say, look, if you want more successes, elect somebody who's even for less government, lower taxes across the board, and less regulation. I'm I'm not arguing with you. <laughs> That's a possibility. So, so I will. So, 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 so I will tell you that at a national level, Americans for Prosperity and the and the Greater Freedom Network, including Concerned Veterans for America, um, Libre Institute, uh, Generation Opportunity, uh, Freedom Partners, we made a similar decision because we do make that decision. So we are not. We we you know if you look at our philosophy, we're more libertarian than we are Republican. We play the game in town, but but. At a national level, last year, in July and August, we made a decision um, to not engage in New Hampshire because Kelly Ayotte was just wrong on a lot of economic policies, and and so. Deregulation has been, the deregulation has not been, the embracing the free market has not really been. 
I agree with you. And we're starting to try to hold some of them accountable without losing the whole big game. So, so we will hold it. So we will hold the ones that we find the most egregious at a national level accountable. And we'll do the same thing here in the state. I, I don't, I mean, same thing with Renee Elmers, right? We, we actively campaigned against Renee Elmers because she had made a lot of um, bad decisions, both, you know, in terms of general culture and moral outlook, as well as in terms of economic policies and tax policies. Um, so, so, so we, you know, we as an organization, we do work to hold um, parties or candidates and, and office holders on both sides of the aisle accountable. Um, and we do not, you know, we do not want uh, Republicans or even libertarians to feel that they're safe to make bad decisions and that, you know, that they're just going to have Americans for prosperity at their back. We will, we will go out and pick off the ones that are most egregious. Um, and, you know, and we've, we've angered some folks, you know, the, the South Carolina General Assembly is trying to kick us out of the state. So <laughs> first So, so yes, sure, for the, for the audience at home. Would AFP, are there conditions where AFP would ever support a libertarian candidate? Um, I gotta just give the full disclaimer. You know, Americans for Prosperity is a 501c4 nonprofit and Americans for Prosperity Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, neither one of them engages in uh, candidate support. We don't endorse candidates. We don't support parties themselves. We do hold candidates accountable, um, and we do engage on issues. Um, and you know, our messaging is very, very friendly to libertarian candidates in races. So if they engage on our issues, they will find that their language mir mirrors our language um, on at least on economic issues all the time. So. If the Republican has done things that, that are on the wrong side of economic issues that, that we really care about, like they've raised taxes consistently, they voted to raise tax on a national level, um, you know, the border adjustment tax has been a big deal for us over the last couple of months, um, trying to keep the border adjustment tax from being passed. You know, we had a target list of folks that we were calling their constituents and having their constituents call their offices. Um, you know, we would certainly talk about a Republican who supported something like the border adjustment tax in a race if we think that they need to be held accountable. So you alluded to pursuing next year that year cap at 200,000. My question is involving incrementalism, where if we say tax sanction is theft, we put that as a campaign slogan, or we're shot dead because we have to grasp the intellectual aspect of it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I would think, but so in these conversations, we, we, we try to engage it softly, so, so as not to really strike you know people offended uh, right off the bat. Um, the question is whether or not, from your perspective, you see that incrementalism as valuable. Uh, Versus, let's say you have the Republican and the Libertarian in the race, and the Republican is saying, let's go for a 200,000 barrel limit. The Libertarian is going, can you validate that there should be any? So I can, I, can, I can absolutely answer that. And it is the subject to no small amount of internal debate in the network. Um, American for Prosperity's um, social change model is incremental, right? Incremental reforms. We believe that you win the fights one at a time in state legislators and in Congress, a um, little bit, you make incremental increases, you get a great state economy, you can hold it as an example of a way for other states to do things better. That said, you know, we work at level three, you know, the universities are at level one, think tanks like Koch Institute, Mercatus, AEI are at level, um, level two, and we're at level three, we're actually engaged with the public and trying to hold legislators accountable and make changes, you know, through the legislative process. Uh, there's a lot of friction between level two and level three with that, particularly, you know, our, the, of all those institutes, Charles Koch Institute is the, the most in-house one that we have. 
that we talk to the most often, and they are very much of the taxation is theft and all things are bad model. Um, and you know, it, sometimes we have to talk our philosophers into remembering that you know there's a pragmatic side. You got to get there one step at a time. You know, none of us can fly to we can't fly America to the taxation is theft model. So. I understand. It's you know, uh, it's it, but facing the enemy is challenging. So, <laughs> so. No, and, and and again, you know, I'm not here to say they've done a great job on everything. Um, I'm here to, yeah, I am not. I am definitely. <laughs> that's one thing I am not. Um, but I am here to say that there are some things that have been done on the economic side over the last six to four, four to six years that have been positive. They're they're typically in keeping overall with libertarian policies, um, and we think more people need to hear about them. And we think that as we share them with more people, um, we'll get more success. And that we'll have folks who, you know, more folks throughout the state who think these are good policies rather than having a knee jerk reaction to hearing about a tax cut and thinking, oh, that means, you know, that's bad for my, that might be great for my wallet, but it's bad for my schools or bad for my community. So, and, and we do want to hold the most egregious um, political office holders accountable for, for violating that. So if we can find a place where, you know, we can hold a member of Republican leadership or Democratic leadership accountable because they're, making bad decisions, we're going to do it. So if we, if we think that we can engage and make a difference with the electorate in a given you know, district and educate them to the point where they're going to make a different decision than they might have, we're going to go in there and try to talk to them and educate them. Anybody else? Folks, thanks for having me tonight. I really appreciated talking to you. So thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you, John, for coming here. Um, so one of the things you saw again in this room is familiar with the craft beer that he doesn't care. Oh. Um, Patrick hooked us up with this, which I, the <laughs> discounted load is super water or something like that. Now, if you fill it with PBR or Coors, uh, you won't be welcome. You didn't hear my, you did hear my beer speech. So, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're good. I'm past uh, PBR and Coors. Thank you for coming. Well, I thank you guys. It. I really appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. September here in Neil Dagger. Uh, young Democrats and young Republicans are having some sort of fundraiser. It's a dollar match event. So we'll look for I'll check with Matt and maybe have something on Facebook here in the next few days. So if you're interested and we're all good with this. Any alibis on anything? Um, other than the fact that Owen Watson is here, so you can now give him money directly in person. Or his campaign manager has that covered, actually, throwing a rock. So. There is, there is, if you go on Facebook, there are, there is a libertarian group that's also raising funds for hurricane relief. So you have that, you have whatever charity you normally donate to through your church, through your temple, what have you. Uh, the point being is uh, charity is a bedrock of libertarian philosophy, so please do give to that cause. So with that in mind, we will close this off and uh, continue to enjoy your beverages. Thank you.